Hey there students and welcome back to Intensive Review. In this segment we're going to discuss USHC 1.6 which deals with the first party system and the conflicts between Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton in Washington's first cabinet. Now keep in mind the cabinet is this group of advisors that Washington or any president would have. Now there's a picture of President Obama's cabinet. You notice that there are a lot of people and his first cabinet you had four people sitting down and the reason that they got to do that is because they occupy the four most ancient positions in the cabinet. You had dominating Washington's first cabinet which only included a Secretary of State, Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of War, and Attorney General. You had Thomas Jefferson, the Secretary of State, and Alexander Hamilton, the Secretary of the Treasury. Keep in mind that Hamilton has a lot of plans for money and that Jefferson is an advocate of states rights, so keeping them together like that, thank you Yutzi for that last one, that you can kind of remember that. But they were rivals that Washington, Lincoln was kind of like this too, that both of them were about assembling a team of rivals and putting people together that don't necessarily like each other or agree with each other or won't always give the same advice. So being as we're in South Carolina, we're going to look at these um, two groups, the, the Hamiltonian Federalists and the Jeffersonian Republicans or Democratic Republicans as some exams will say. We're going to look at them with Clemson and Carolina colors. All right, now of course Jefferson will be Clemson because he was a champion of the farmers and Hamilton more into business and that sort of thing and urbanization. So he'll be Carolina. All right, so Hamilton and John Adams, these were leaders of the Federalist Party. Meanwhile, the Jeffersonian Republicans or Democratic Republicans, as you may see on your exam, Jefferson and Madison. Now, keep in mind, we may think of like most of these people as having been anti-Federalist, but then again, James Madison was a Federalist and he crosses over because he's got a Jeffersonian view of the Constitution. So there are a lot of people in Jefferson's party who were in favor of the Constitution, but maybe not in the same way of interpretation as Hamilton and Adams who wanted a stronger central government. Whereas the Jeffersonians wanted states' rights. They believed in the states having rights above the central government. And then as far as the Constitution, the Hamiltonians, loose construction. All right, that we should be able to bend things when we want to, okay? Loose construction, that if the power is kind of implied, then the, gov the federal government should have it. Meanwhile, the Jeffersonians, strict construction, all right? If the power is not there, can't do it, okay? That the Constitution is not something to be bent and stretched and all of that kind of stuff. That only the enumerated powers are the powers of the central government. At least that's what they say when they're in the opposition. And then as far as government involvement in the economy, that Hamilton would like to see the government involved in economic development to help the development of business. Now the Jeffersonians, no. Now that being partly because the Jeffersonians are a party of farmers. And as far as the National Bank, very yes. Alexander Hamilton, that's his big pet project is the National Bank. And the Jeffersonians again, no. All right, protective tariff. A tariff that is not just designed to fund the government, but a tariff that is designed to thwart competition and to encourage American industry. Hamilton wants that. Jefferson says, first of all, where is that in the Constitution? Second of all, how does that help farmers? So the Jeffersonian Democratic Republicans, kind of the original party of no, that they're the party of a smaller central government that does not interact with the economy and interprets the Constitution very strictly. Federal assumption of state debts. Should the federal government take on the debts of the states that they incurred after the American Revolution? And Hamilton says, yes, we should just put it all in a common pot. The Jeffersonians, no. All right, and as far as supporters, urban, people who were engaged in commerce, these are the people that supported the Federalists, whereas farmers and people in rural areas supported the Jeffersonian Democratic Republicans. And as far as Jefferson, keep in mind his attachment to agriculture. We see here was a, a kind of a typical sort of emblem for societies for the promotion of agriculture. We see here venerate the plow. You know, this is an integral part of our republic that Jefferson wrote in his notes on the state of Virginia, those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God, if ever he had a chosen people, whose breast he has made his peculiar deposit for substantial and genuine virtue. It is the focus in which he keeps alive that sacred fire, 
which otherwise might escape from the face of the earth. So the Jeffersonians were the party of the farmers. You know, you could picture, I mean, it's no, no accident really. It's probably a coincidence, but it's a very historical coincidence when you see that Jefferson is on the $2 bill, which Clemson fans use when they go to bowl games and that sort of thing. So, you know, Jefferson, champion of agriculture. Clemson, a more agricultural university historically. And keep in mind, the Jeffersonian economic model had to do with the states, just like the colonies had, producing raw materials and trading with Europe for finished goods and having this free trade going on between the United States and Europe. And so keep that in mind that that's Jeffersonian economics. Now Hamilton is more concerned about our public credit more concerned with developing industry and banking in the United States. You've seen these commercials before with these guys with the credit scores and all of that kind of stuff, and you got these two tall, these two tall, good-looking guys, and then you've got the short guy who's balding and he's got his Jason mask on and he's got a lower credit score. This was the United States in 1789. What's the little guy? Bald, Jason mask, all of that. That was us. And what Hamilton wants to do, he's got proposals that pursue three goals. First of all, he wants public credit. He wants the United States, when the United States has debts, for it to mean something that people think they're going to pay it back. Then he wants a national bank so that we can manage our debt and manage the economy and all of that. And finally, he wants to encourage domestic manufacturing, whereas Jefferson has no interest in any of this stuff. Now, Washington's farewell address, as far as the big takeaways that you're most likely to see on an exam, is one, he is warning against political partisanship, that he sees the formation of political parties as a threat to small r Republican government. And then he warns against entangling alliances, all right, that we don't need to get into alliances with other countries. We need to trade with them. Entangling alliance is actually something that Jefferson uses later, but it's a Washingtonian construct that we need to trade with everyone, but we don't need to get involved in European conflicts. The United States should have a separate foreign policy. Now, the election of 1796 is our first partisan election where John Adams gets elected. Now, Washington had warned us about partisanship, warned us about meddling in Europe. Well, it doesn't take us long to do both. And in 1796, we see that sectionalism, which is a theme of U.S. history, is also very evident here, where you have the farther north and the farther east you go, then the more likely you're going to see support for Adams. The farther south and the farther west you go, you see support for Jefferson. Now, in 1796, Adams ekes out a very razor-thin electoral victory, which Jefferson is going to do kind of the opposite. He's going to eke out a razor-thin victory the other way in 1800. And partisan newspapers, which we hear the media criticize, they say that our media is very partisan, that sort of thing, really had nothing on these people, all right? That these parties had newspapers, Jefferson paid his guy, Hamilton paid his guy, and they went back and forth with each other. And they would say insulting things about the president, called President Adams old, querulous, bald, blind, crippled, toothless Adams. And the Federalists got tired of it. They passed the Alien Sedition Acts. Okay, in the course of this, you had this Griswold lion fight, people actually fighting each other. And the Alien Sedition Acts, now as far as who, all right, that they have placed, as far as the Alien Sedition Acts, that the Federalists in Congress passed these acts and they clamp down on citizenship and political speech because they think that immigrants are going to vote with the Jeffersonian Democratic Republicans. Just like today, when people side on the immigration debate, who are they going to vote for? The people that think they're going to get the votes want it. The people that don't think they're going to get the votes don't want it. All right, so the Alien Sedition Acts put these restrictions on citizenship and political speech in spite of the First Amendment. And what happens here? The Sedition Act was not constitutional because the First Amendment says that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. And so this is a reserved power, and Congress has usurped this power. So Madison and Jefferson write the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, and these are protest resolutions that are aimed at the federal government. And what they do is they say that state legislatures can protest. Now Jefferson goes so far even to say nullify unconstitutional laws. 
And in the Kentucky resolutions, Jefferson says, in question of power then, question of power then, let no more be heard of confidence in man, but bind him down with the chains of the Constitution. Now, this protest movement kind of dies because Jefferson's saying, like, don't secede or anything like that. We're just going to try to get elected. And that's what he does in 1800, the so-called revolution of 1800, where the Jeffersonians get elected and this whole nullification states' rights thing is going to go to sleep and fight another day. So with that, in the next segment, we will look at the Marshall Court and all of the decisions there and kind of compare John Marshall and Thomas Jefferson. Hopefully you'll continue with us. See you in a bit.